economy. Um, let's jump right into it. So Steve Jobs said the only way to do great work is to do what you love, and I don't think that's a very controversial statement. It's entirely incomplete. Um, really, that's step two. Step one is how do you navigate or how do you find your way to actually something that you truly love so that you can do great work. And so the next 10, 15 minutes, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about my journey, uh, finding and figuring out what it is that I truly love so that I had an opportunity to potentially do great work. Um, this is my dad. Uh, my dad is a material scientist. Um, if you couldn't guess, this is from the 1970s by the big hair. Um, this is a younger professor at Cornell University. And my dad is incredibly curious. And this curiosity was an amazing gift to give to me and my brothers. So he would spend countless hours opening up a lot of the equipment that you see here and explaining to us how it works, what it does, what the experiments that he was running could actually help create new products, new materials for jet engines, for cars. And so that was incredibly, that got embedded in me at a very, very young age, the sense of curiosity. So a lot of my dad's research focused on a very specific type of alloy called the nickel-based alloy. And it's used primarily in, in a lot of applications, but primarily in jet, uh, jet turbine engines. So you know these big GE90 uh, airplane engines. And so he would go off to all these conferences um, at GE, at Boeing, and so forth. And as 10 and 11-year-olds, he would come back with all these incredible brochures and all these incredible imagery about these machines, whether it be airplanes or jet engines. And me and both my brothers, we were just fascinated by it. You know, this idea that, you know, looking at the materials, looking at the rivets, looking at, you know, all of the different types of materials that they use to act for, for, the, for the wings versus um, the fuselage, like that was the things that we spent our time on. So as most kids, when they get on an airplane, they're like, okay, where are the snacks, right? Like, where, where's the entertainment? Um, when I would get on an airplane as a 10 or 11 year old, first I wanted to know, are we flying an Airbus? Are we flying a Boeing? You know, what kind of engines do they have? Are they Pratt & Whitney's? Are they GE's? Um, like very different kinds of things. I would actually, like I remember specifically boarding airplanes and inspecting the rivets as I boarded the airplane. Like, okay, <laughs> like Captain, we're ready to go here. We're, I think it's okay. Um, and, and so that was my world and that was the things that got me excited as a kid. And so, you know, my, my parents were both academia, kind of liberal hippie types, um, and so we had no TV in our house. They thought it was like, you know, going to help us in some way. Um, the, the downside of that is I am a, I know no trivia, so like you do not want me on your Trivial Pursuit team. Bad idea. Um, the upside is, is that we entertained ourselves with Legos, and we built these like replicas of MD-11s and Sikorsky helicopters and all these kind of weird things, um, and it was, it was a blast. We had a good time doing it. So we graduated. Ultimately, we kind of went from Legos to RC helicopters to ultimately drones. And so what you're looking at right here is actually one of the more popular drones. So this is what it looks like. Um, this thing can fly speeds up to about 35 miles an hour uh, for about 23 minutes. And if you've ever flown RC helicopters, you know uh, they don't really do a good job of maintaining their position, and they don't do a good job of maintaining level. You can actually take your hands off the sticks, and it'll just sit in position there, which is incredible. Um, so this is one of the more popular ones, really kind of the iPhone of the drones. Um, because we're at a high school, I had to leave its laser-guided missiles at home. So, um, <laughs> But it is, it, is, it is only $1,200. And so if you compare the technology they're packing into this today versus five, six years ago, it was probably seven or eight thousand dollars versus twelve hundred dollars. So, is this is thing is I mean you, you guys will you play around with it later. This is only about three pounds. If you compare that, it's about the size of a parrot, right? And so I think a lot of people think of drones as like these big scary things. And yes, there are those big scary things, but the vast majority of drones that we'll all see hopefully um, are you know two point two pounds. They're cute. They're fun. They're like little parrots. So when you open up a drone, really you're looking at a flying smartphone. And this is really important because all the, you know, we're now generating or building rather billions of smartphones a year. And so all of the components, whether it be Wi-Fi, whether it be accelerometers, compasses, you will find those inside of a drone. 
And so as we build more and more smartphones, all of those components become a lot cheaper, and therefore the drones get cheaper, and you'll all go out and buy one for like 100 bucks in a couple years. So um, a lot of use cases for drones. Uh, you know, I think today we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, whether it be photography, creativity, precision agriculture, uh, mining, and then ultimately kind of delivery. You know, Amazon Prime Air probably is the good example of that, but guess what? There's going to be like 500 other people trying to figure out delivery as well. But I think really the big news is really not the hardware, it's apps for drones. So all of a sudden, you can actually create an app. So think about this, as simple as it is to create an app for the iPhone or the Android, you can now go ahead with a little bit of programming skills, go out and buy yourself a drone, and all of a sudden, you can actually build your own aviation product. And so think about that, that's crazy. Like this idea that 10 years ago, if you wanted to build aviation products, you either had to go work at Boeing, and if you're into startups, probably not the first place you're thinking about, uh, or you had to go and build your own airplane company. And so now, with $1,200, you can actually go and build your own aviation product. And so the cost of building this stuff has dropped dramatically, and so that means there's going to unleash a massive amount of innovation. Uh, this is my son. His name is Jonah. Um, he actually likes to wear my jacket. Um, or maybe I like wearing his. Uh, so we go out and we fly drones like every weekend. You know, this is our father bonding son, uh, and we love it and we explore new areas. And uh, actually, just really quickly, Jonah asked me, he, he's created this Lego transportation system via drones. So if you do have Lego guys that need transport, you should call Jonah. Um, so little, little ad. <laughs> um, so we were flying one day. And we're flying in the hills above Palo Alto. Uh, Jonah starts egging me on, you know, go over there, make it go over there, let's go over there. And so when you say make it go over there, you're, you're kind of guessing, right, when you're flying the thing, especially as it's getting out, uh, you know, 500 feet or beyond that. And so I'm flying, and I'm like, okay, i got to show off to my son, I'm going to go fly. And then, boom, hit some trees, dies, and now it lives in that tree line that you see over there. So drones really have no awareness of their surroundings. Right? You're in control. If there's any issue, um, you're going to hit something very, very quickly, and it's going to just you know, fall out of the air and, and, and die. And that's a big buzzkill, like you know, $1,200 down the drain. You don't want to be explaining that to your wife too often. <laughs> um, so this guy, so if you actually just do some searches around YouTube, um, you'll notice that crashing drones is like pretty common these days still. Um, so if we could just roll the video. So this guy has a depleted battery. All right. What's he going to do? <laughs> Bang! He got it. He got it. He got it. So, um, so what happens there is the battery had depleted. The, the, again, drones just are like, oh, battery low. I got to go land. It has no situational awareness around where it's actually landing. So it has no information, it has no data about where it's located and where it needs to go. Very, very different than driving, right? Like driving, you know, okay, there's a road here, there's a sign there, it's giving you information. Um, so it turns out that new technologies um, are very, very prone, or I should say new transportation technologies are very, very prone to navigational errors. So if you go back to 1707, uh, Sir Cloudsley Shovel, uh, that was actually his name, um, he, 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 was the, uh, he had a, a fleet, and he was headed back to England, um, and he had to navigate through the English Channel. Um, and so at this point in time, they had actually figured out how to navigate successfully and precisely north-south, or latitude, using the angle of the sun so they could figure out how far they were away from the sun or the equator, more precisely. Uh, but longitude east-west, it was kind of a guessing game still, right? Not, not too different than maybe flying drones today. Um, and so, unfortunately and sadly, the HMS Association and the entire fleet hit some rocks off the English Channel, and 2,000 men died within like five minutes. Um, thankfully, we've improved our navigational techniques for, for navigating the seas. We now have shipping lanes and so forth as well. Um, but, next slide. Um, it kind of struck me as like, wait, we have shipping lanes for navigation. We have highways and roads for cars. We have flight paths for commercial aviation. But none of that data inf infrastructure, that information, exists for drones. So the opportunity to create drones, 
with roads, with very clear demarcations around where the obstructions are, where the points of interest are, that is an interesting and significant opportunity given the growth of drones. So the problem was, and I'll just kind of really pause, I'll pause quickly here, is I was working on something very different. And uh, at the time, that product was not going very well. And so uh, you know, I built a lot of products in my time, and you know, they've always had some level of success. And so here I was kind of staring into the abyss. We had raised money, venture capital money. The venture capital money was like going down a lot quicker than I would like. And we had employees, and we were working on something different. And I was struggling. I was, you know, frankly, I was scared. Um, and this was a very tough time in our lives trying to figure out and make this other product work. And so we had a little bit more money left in the bank, and we either had two options. One is, you know, go get a job, basically, uh, which we weren't too thrilled about, um, or try something else. So we had the passion. So we under we, we, the team and myself would just love, love flying and love drones. And like, that's maybe the reason that we all kind of got together in the first place. Uh, we, we saw a very clear problem, that maps needed to exist for drones. Um, and, and we also had a little bit of money left that we can actually go do this. So what we've created is called Hive Mapper. And so Hive Mapper is trying to map, um, and is mapping, the virgin airspace between zero feet and 500 feet. And we're doing this pretty differently than I think most mapping companies, right? If you're a mapping company, if you're Google, you know, or frankly Apple, you just have like billions and billions of dollars, so you're just like, okay, yeah, I'll map this space and I'll, I'll, I'll basically buy all this data. We're doing this community or crowdsourced. And so the idea here is that individuals in local communities, people like myself, frankly, we already love to fly. We can help map this space such that people who come after us or just our buddies can start to use this. So very similar kind of the Waze model where your information and your data can help other drivers. Similarly here in this case, we want it, we want it, we want it to be totally crowdsourced. And we're going to make flying safer and easier. So let me show you how this works. When you fly with Hive Mapper, or sorry, before you, if you're not flying with Hive Mapper, uh, this is kind of what the world looks like. And you have a real-time video feed that you can see through your phone, and you'll see that shortly. Um, but when you fly with Hive Mapper, something really awesome happens. And so you see something more like this. And you see over here that there is a launch pad, or I should say more specifically, a launch point, as well as a landing spot. So you remember that guy who had a problem because he was depleted, his battery was depleted, and so the, the drone just kind of landed in a pond of water? Like, that won't happen here with Hive Mapper because there are existing known safe places in the map where you can actually go land in and, and without issue. The other big thing is you see all the different green dots. Those are called waypoints, and those will actually navigate you very safely around all the no-fly zones to your destination. Um, so you see over here on the left-hand side, it's kind of going around the, um, the no-fly zone. And then in the right, on the upper right-hand corner, you see that it's actually the, the path, the flight path is following close by to, act, to, um, uh, to little uh, uh, landing spots so that if it does have an issue, it can go ahead and land. And again, these are totally community-generated. So these aren't, you know, us going out there and doing this. These are people going out there, and we'll help them and guide them along the way. But ultimately, the data is being captured by the drone, by these individuals who are actually flying it. So we launched uh, about 10, week, 10 weeks ago, so we're still little babies. We have a long way to go until we're all grown up. Um, and we launched here in the San Francisco Bay Area about 1,300 different waypoints. And the team is now, like, like, if I compare the team before in terms of what we're working on to now, it is like a 10x difference. Like, people are coming to work, and they're, like, super excited. They're staying late because they want to create this. There's a sense of mission. There's a sense of excitement there around what we're building. So we now have the opportunity, because we found something that we love, to build it into something really great. So I want to leave you with one last thing. So imagine getting into your car after you leave this presentation, um, hopefully you won't all get up and leave now. Uh, so you, you get up, you get into your car, you punch in wherever you want to go next. And then Google Maps at this point takes over and just drives you along your way to your destination. So this will happen in cars, but it will happen in drones much, much earlier. And so let me show you what it looks like. So again, if you're flying without Hive Mapper today, all you're seeing is a video feed, right? Like, okay, here's, you know, 
and, and then you can take pictures, you can do whatever you want, right? When you fly with Hive Mapper, what we do is we actually overlay the entire map onto your screen in real time. So as the drone is flying, it can see, okay, there's a waypoint over there, there's a waypoint over here, and those waypoints form the roads. They form the highways up in the air, and you can interact with them. So you can tap on it and say, hey, I want to go to this one. How far away am I from this? Okay, that's 1,900 feet. I have enough battery. Uh, if, you won't, if, you, if you don't have enough battery, it won't actually allow you to fly there. And then the beautiful part of it is you can just say, fly me here. And so you just will autonomously fly you using a route that's actually been created by other people, that's been used by other people, so we know it's safe, you're not gonna crash. Um, and what that does is it dramatically changes the way that we fly. So today when we fly, we basically, you know, we have this thing over here, your drone's up in the air, and it's kind of annoying, right? You're like, you have this thing, you're on the stick sometimes, then you have this thing, which is your, which is your smartphone, and you have to kind of look at both. What we believe and what will happen once we have this data is we can just throw this away. And you're just navigating with Hive Map or with all this existing data. And so we can get rid of that and it will make flying that much safer, that much easier, and that much more fun. Thank you, guys.